the only name that I've been adding every week for like the last six or seven weeks is SoFi. I bought the only name. Tesla. Yeah, only name. Every single week, SoFi. So uh, since like the first two weeks. So yeah, I bought that. I bought this week as well. I did not. You guys buy? I, I bought a go. different name. I bought Tesla also. Yeah. I won't go on the uh, rant about New Bank, but New Bank is now a larger fintech position in my portfolio than SoFi is. Those earnings were really good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the so SoFi sure Weekly. Weekly. There was a little bit of a podcast that happened this week with Kathy Wood and Anthony Noto. They got to sit down, talk about business relationship in the past, what they're doing now, Kathy investing in SoFi, and also why SoFi thinks that they have an advantage that no other company does. They yep. should have right. went longer. They cut it off at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And they should do part two because they ended on what is probably the most important thing for the bull thesis, the AWS of FinTech. It was a good episode, but yeah, Steve is absolutely right. They basically like, well, we're just about out of time. How about just a mention on Galileo and the AWS of FinTech? And they're like, okay, done. It's like, Kathy Wood probably has a crush on Anthony Noto. Because I mean, like she was very uh, bullish, not just on SoFi, but on Noto himself. And there's a, a neat shared history there. And then she keeps buying the stock just like crazy. I heard the feedback was that they didn't touch on the tech platform enough. But the positive is that Anthony Noto doesn't do a lot of podcasts and a lot of his remarks are scripted remarks, they're prepared remarks, they're stuff that's been vetted multiple times by multiple different teams of people. To have him on these podcasts talking about SoFi, like I think that's something that we as a retail investor community have been really starving for because of the backdrop, because of the fact that she is buying so heavily, because of the fact that, you know, this time last week, essentially, Kathy had about 2.5 million shares and now she has over 8 million shares. It's a heavy accumulation in a short period of time. Not to mention the fact that ARK Invest name dropped SoFi like three times this week when they were talking about the ARK X portfolio and then also promoting this podcast multiple times. And so it seems as though she's definitely warming up to that. I mean, she called it like one of the leading digital wallets of the future, something like that. Obviously, very bullish sentiment. But the critique, and again, I have not seen the full podcast yet, so I can't have a first hand knowledge, but the critique that I was seeing was that it doesn't seem as though Kathy is really leaning very heavily on the AWS of FinTech aspect to form her bull case. She's not leaning on it at all. There was one point in the podcast, Tevis, where Anthony Noto is talking about the data moat that they're starting to create because of the amount of transactions that they're dealing in, because of all of these things, how AI is going to forward that. And he's talking about using the risk platform to, to help with that. Kathy Wood asks, oh, what what platform are you using to help with your, your uh, you know, fraud detection and risk? And then he had to explain, SoFi has a white label technology called Galileo. We use our own technology. Yeah, I, I think, and this is just a uh, supposition, that a certain amount of ARK Invest, like it's there to attract attention. Like that, that's why they do you know, the interviews. That's why she goes on CNBC and everything. You want people flocking to your fund. And so I think a certain amount of their allocation is going to go to retail heavy stocks that people recognize and love. Um, so of course they have the the good old Colt stock Tesla and they'll trade in and out of that, but they'll always have some. Palantir is one that they dumped for a while, but they're, they're back to it. And Palantir was at one point, I think either the only name or maybe one uh, of two only names that were across all of the ARC funds. They have not bought in as heavy as they were before, but SoFi seems to be that too. So maybe she doesn't know SoFi. She certainly doesn't know SoFi as well as the three of you guys, maybe as well as me. Uh, but uh, and, and that's not great for somebody that owns eight million shares. But uh, I, I think that possibly the reason she bought it was the trust level in Anthony Noto, which is initially what uh, got me to buy in. It's retail heavy and it, it tracks attention. Uh, it gets that focus. And so I think that there's an element of that. She didn't talk about the tech platform. She obviously, from Tanner's comments, doesn't really know the effect to which the tech platform can add a multiplying aspect to SoFi's growth prospects. And yet, despite all of that, she's still buying hand over fist. I even think like, even if we give her the benefit of the doubt and just say, okay, well, she's actually naive and she genuinely doesn't know about it, or she hasn't done that much DD, or that, the fact that she's still buying hand over fist consistently and building this up to be a larger position without the tech platform 
like you could spin that to be even more bullish than her having known about it in the first place. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, Kathy is just the managing director of that fund, but the actual analyst knows way more. These guys go 10 layers deep. So Kathy yeah. doesn't have, to. that's literally their job, their function in that organization. But the fact that they had Anthony Noda on the podcast now just makes me think. I think anybody who's invested in SoFi or is interested in SoFi as an investment should listen to it. Overall, it was a very good podcast. Anthony Noto did a phenomenal job explaining his thoughts on a competition, what companies in fintech he thinks will continue to do good. He didn't bash anybody. He said there's going to be several winners that take most. And he was very articulate the way that he always is. I just was not happy that there's no time limit. This wasn't a episode on CNBC or on Bloomberg. There's no time limit for them to stop it right at the particular metric of an hour, whatever it was, was ridiculous. That interview could have went on for another 20 or 30 minutes. It did seem like the analyst knew much more about SoFi on a granular level than Kathy did. And look, Kathy's known of him for a long time. She knows his background. She's probably seen the slide deck and obviously has had conversations with him. They're business partners now. She probably likes what she sees. Her analysts probably say this thing's the real thing. I'm not surprised it's in ARCF and ARKK, and I think it's in one other fund. Yes, it's great. Exposure is great. Noto getting airtime on podcasts or TV is great because he does a really good job explaining things. But I would venture to guess that ARK was the one who wanted this interview rather than SoFi, mm. simply because you know, it was split at that one hour mark. And if you think about, okay, what is the desired outcome of an interview like this? ARK Invest right now has it up on their YouTube channel and they're promoting the heck out of it. I mean, they've made several tweets about it. Anthony Noto has also tweeted this thing out. And yet, despite all of that, it only has about 11,000 views. If you're thinking about max reach with YouTube as a medium, then ARK Invest is not like the person to go to. And so it leads me to believe that SoFi was not, in fact, the ones who asked for this interview, it was ARC, so that they can start promoting SoFi more as like, um, you know, a company that they're holding or are bullish in. Anthony Noto talked about how he suspected that the competition for what he called like horizontal digital banking being a one-stop shop would have been much stronger than he would have thought. He was really worried about Goldman Sachs at the time, their Marcus platform. He had a bunch of names that he was really worried about. And then he said, they've all failed. And part of the reason why uh, why that happened is because they had what, in his terms, nine plus larger revenue streams that they could just lean back on. And so they don't have the, the startup mentality of burning the bridge behind them and having to survive on this island. He said, I know this sounds egotistical, but the facts are facts. We are the only ones operating with $2 billion in revenue gap profitable with our long-term margin expansion and tangible book value growth. I just thought it would have been a longer war. How crazy is that? As if he had already taken home the championship. He spoke about a lot of other fintech competitors as well. He brought up Chime, Dave.com, Robinhood, Firm, about Square. Really interesting to sort of peer into Anthony Noto's psyche around who he views as <laughs> SoFi's core competitors, you know. Dave, Chime, the, the cash apps, the all of these little neobanks. And yet there's a massive discrepancy because the street, all of these analysts, who are they saying? They're saying Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, so, all of these legacy players. So he does yeah. he actually does say the only competitors that he has are the incumbents, mm -hmm. saying that there will be category killers that will survive. Just on that quote though, you know, I, I thought this war would be longer. Again. Yeah, I don't think anybody's denying that SoFi has this duality in terms of their competition. They have the legacy players and they have the new incumbents. It's just what he's choosing to focus on to say, okay, the war is over essentially. And it's just SoFi and maybe one or two other names against the legacy players left. Even that is interesting to me in isolation, because if you have this entire behemoths and you're trying to disrupt the banking industry, how would you view it as, okay, the war is over because we've beaten all the new incumbents out? You know? Yeah, yeah. There was a, another part, Tevis, that you really will love to hear where he's talking about how they caught a lot of flack for becoming a SPAC. And mm -hmm. he said, you know, I've been a part of 
like a hundred plus IPOs at my day at, at Goldman Sachs. My my large expertise in IPOs is what made me knew what made me know that we needed to SPAC because we needed a ton of capital up front in order to go after a banking license. And so he said, you know, SPACs might not have been for everyone, but it was a perfect solution for what we needed. Very unique case. This is a guy who was the guy at Goldman. Yeah. He's the guy that called eBay. I believe he called Amazon. Mm -hmm. He called Google. I mean, this is what he used to do. And he has one of the most impressive track records from a CEO. He knows what is involved in either IPO or SPAC or how to go public and the best way to take something to the market. And he knows what people are looking for. The real question is, can another neobank come out and do what SoFi has done and grown into what SoFi has done? I mean, theoretically, yes, but is it probable? Like, that's the thing. Is it probable? If it's a new bank or SoFi and somebody who's going to go with the two, SoFi's already got the brand recognition and is on its way to being a household name. Like, yeah. you got to do so much to compete with them. I just don't see it. It's people have to trust Noto. And I know this quote was pulled out of the podcast where he was saying something to the effect of, you know, our biggest challenge right now is to build that trust. And once we can build our trust, not only with users, with the market, with the wider landscape, we're a challenger in that race, but building that trust, especially as a new incumbent is the hard part because you have so much to prove. And I think that, you know, to Tanner's point, the best CEOs out there, they have this ability to see the future. You know, we see an event happening today and we might think it's peculiar, but in the case of SoFi, yeah, the SPAC was an example of that. The MBA partnership from all of the stuff that we've been seeing in the background, that's been in the works for months. That's probably been approved for months. And for them to announce it, you know, right before All-Star Weekend, really Noto right now is playing in the space of 2025, 2026. Those are yeah. the partnerships that he's working on. Those are the initiatives that he's actively pursuing. Those are the kinds of conversations that he's having. Why? Because 2024 is already baked in the cake. Like that is already done, sealed, delivered, and waiting to be announced. And the rest of us, we can't see that far ahead. And we're thinking, okay, well, when we're, will SoFi you know, hit a million members or whatever, even though they already have internal projections that are different from what they're providing to the market. And so it really is a matter, Steve, of just building that trust and through consistent execution, continuing to convince the market that, hey, we are in fact a true contender and we're here to stay. Well, what else does Noto need to do for the market or investors to trust them? That's my question. Nothing out of the ordinary, just consistency. Two quarters of profitability is better than one. Three quarters is better than two. Four quarters is better than three, so on and so forth. Over time, they will build that trust. Every subsequent quarter, they build more and more trust with their users. That's testament to the added members. With their brand, that's testament to the partnerships. And with their investor community, that's testament to, I mean, right now, one of my things that I've been sort of repeating over and over again is this base that's forming from an institutional perspective, which I'm sure we can talk about a little bit more. More and more people are discovering the SoFi name, more and more people are doing their due diligence, and more people are becoming more bullish on SoFi. I don't care what the stock price you know, is saying today because the stock price could well lag the company events by six months. I care about what are what's the sentiment like, what's the execution like, and what is the goodwill essentially that that bakes into it every single quarter through that consistency of execution. Just from the latest 13F filings, if you check on Fintel or if you check on uh, any of these websites that track hedge funds, you will see that many institutions are adding onto SoFi. And the main one that we're talking about is Kathy Wood's ARK Invest. But there's a couple of other prominent names that are adding to SoFi. Um, one of them is Paul Tudor Jones of uh, Tudor Capital. And another one is Jim, Sim Jim Simmons of Renaissance Technologies, which is like the father of like quant trading for those who don't know. Now, these funds, some of them are swing traders, and I get that. And some of them have owned SoFi before for brief periods of time, like they've gone in on one quarter and they've exited their position on another quarter. But this is the first month per this 13F filing where so many of these names are entering at the same time. Ken Griffin at Citadel Capital is buying, you know, hand over fist for SoFi. And so while Kathy Wood is definitely the most popular name out there, 
particularly from what happened in 2020, that whole boom with regards to ARK Invest and innovative investing, growth investing in general. A lot of these guys, they're steady hitters and they've been so for decades. I mean, Paul Tudor Jones is a legend. Jim Simmons is a legend. Ken Griffin, whether you like him or hate him, like he is one of the biggest out there. So they're all entering SoFi particularly at a quarter after we've reported profitability. And this is why I say consistently time and time again, every single video I have, that this is an inflection point for SoFi because all of these previous years could have been behind the scenes building years. But now that we've hit that profitability, some institutions are still going to be on the sidelines because they need confirmation of consistently being profitable instead of it, you know, could potentially could be a fluke, but some are going to see the writing on the wall and are going to jump into SoFi. And we're seeing that en masse right now with a lot of the biggest names out there. That that provides a lot of stability for the stock. Uh, SoFi has been very volatile. It's great for traders. For long-term investors, maybe not quite as good. So the higher the institutional investment percentage, usually the more stable. Long, If you're a long-term investor, you want to see low, uh, very high institution uh, investment. Uh, if you're short-term and you just want to trade. But this week's been such a long week that... It's hard to remember, but on Monday, Capital One um, made a move to acquire Discover in an effort to consolidate in that credit card space. The credit card space is one that SoFi also contributes in, albeit it's a smaller contribution overall. Weird that a lot of people are talking about this as too much of like a monopoly and not enough as taking away from the duopoly that is Visa and MasterCard. You know, it's not like Capital One is doing something that doesn't exist. Look at American Express. American Express already has an ability to have a card network and issue their own cards while having a bank license. That's what Capital One's trying to do. This is a massive blow to MasterCard. They're their third largest client, which by the way, just because a company acquires a new technology like Discover Financial Services does not mean that they can pour over every single one of their cards onto this technology without scale that might take years and years and years and years to get to. You're going to see small bits, in my opinion, of Capital One going over to Discover, and you're probably not even going to see that in the next 12 to 18 months. Is this positive or is this negative for SoFi? I personally think it's going to be a very very low implication, pretty much nothing. It's inconsequential to the grand scheme, but it's still something that has some type of effect. Where it would hurt SoFi is just Capital One having so much more resources as a, as a consolidated play. I think now it's like the sixth biggest financial institution, something like that. But I think where it will help SoFi, and there are probably a lot of users at Discover that are going to have their service change or at the very, very high level that are not going to be a fan of the consolidated product offering after Capital One acquired them. And those people are up for grabs, essentially, or will be up for grabs over the next 12 months so as to potentially bolster SoFi's credit card business or something to that effect. The other aspect where it could potentially help SoFi, and I know Steve doesn't like this, it does direct more eyeballs to M&A attention in the space to further consolidate. It's something that makes waves. People can very easily go one step further to associate to say, okay, well, what else is in that industry that is undervalued or, or so on and so forth? I, I don't think this does anything to SoFi at all. It's so nominal in, in either direction. SoFi really doesn't even have a credit card business. And for the personal loan businesses and the banking side, I don't think that it's, it's that consequential. And yeah, I was so shocked to see such a sizable M&A, by the way. The, the, like, I think the week before, I was like, yeah, I can't see anything happening with SoFi. There's not a lot of activity right now. Boom, one of the largest M&A transactions in a, in a very long time. So when you see a major uh, acquisition like this happen and yeah. regulators not do too much other than just make some noise, that opens the door for further acquisition, just like you said. So that could be yeah. a beneficiary there. They have some work to do on credit card. Credit card seems to be, from a profitability perspective, a low-hanging fruit for SoFi, let alone expansion and members and all that stuff. This consolidation in the credit card space specifically you know, made me think about that to say, okay, well, if it's going to affect SoFi positively, how early on can we see that reflected? And if it's not going to affect SoFi positively, what is SoFi then doing to counteract this new move in the market that's unforeseen.
uh, uh, sentiment. Right now, it's not the lowest I've seen with SoFi, but it's fairly low. If, if something happens and SoFi is trading back in the sevens, which is very possible this next week on a pullback, general market or just banks are weak or whatever, you're going to see a lot of sour sentiment uh, on X or whatever platform that you use. This week was a really good reminder just how fast sentiment really can turn. Sentiment is is basically built on stock action, on stock price action. So if the stock is going down and, and falling off like PayPal, it, it's terrible right now. It's, it's probably at the all-time low that I've seen it as a PayPal investor, even though the stock's not at the all-time low. Uh, SoFi is pretty far down there. I do see a lot of people that are SoFi shareholders that are frustrated because they're seeing other fintech companies, not just AI, not just semiconductors, go on these great runs. Of course, Block did quite well this week, phenomenally well. Ramahood last week, uh, we saw a firm, you know, of course, last, late last year. Um, and it can be frustrating as a shareholder to be like, why is my stock not getting any love? They're having these killer results. If, if you continue to execute, you know, things can change in a hurry and sentiment changes yeah. ridiculously fast. Robinhood back in November was despised and hated people were talking how it's it's going bankrupt which is like it has no debt and it has like seven billion in cash but okay we'll pretend that it was a load no matter what you said no matter what thread i, I wrote on it i didn't write too much on it a lot of backlash and negative feedback this week like it, it broke into the 14s it's flying up it was flying after hours it shouldn't be i get i, I think it's still slightly undervalued but uh the, the sentiment has turned and now you post something robin hood they're like wow i've never thought about this company before as an investment and how high can it go can it go into the 30s i was like but i am almost positive so if i will have that i can't guarantee it that, that it is this year but there is going to be a time when instead of this negative sourness no matter what and people are like so if a loser and this and that why don't you invest in bitcoin or or what have you me personally i'm going to continue to hold they're executing i know sentiment just follows a price action we'll see the other side of this too crazy how fast that the stock prices can turn around and even for paypal you look at square look at Robinhood, look at shift four these companies in the matter of single quarters doubled whenever they were being held down that low is where sentiment's the worst across retail is uh so so it has this ad right here on the mba official site and we just did a similar web search mba gets about 70 million um hits per month about 51 percent of that traffic is from the us now there could be a lot of people using vpns but that's like 30 million people that got me sort of thinking around the numbers and this prediction around SoFi getting 1 million members per quarter. And really, I looked at some of these MBA stats, you know, about 35 million US specific visitors per month of the MBA site, about 11 to 18 million viewers of the MBA finals. This is based on 2023, uh, 2022, and 2021 numbers. So the last three years, trailing three, uh, about 5.8 million average TV viewers for a regular season game in 2023. Even the NBA draft peaked out at 6 million viewers for the draft in 2023. And so it really got me very bullish because of the impact that the NBA can have on SoFi's member editions, because that's going to happen this quarter. We're going to see members this quarter that come from this NBA partnership. We're going to see more members in Q2, more members in Q3, and so on and so forth that are going to happen this year as a result of this. And I really just wanted to share some of these numbers because when you look at, you know, tens of millions of visitors every month, tens of millions of viewers, um, you know, for these individual games, you know that SoFi is going to be running multiple ads during all of these games. Really, to me, that is the contributing factor. That's an unknown, or it wasn't unknown when I made that prediction back in December. Today, it seems as though, okay, yeah, one million like you can feasibly put the puzzle pieces together to say, how can SoFi get there? I really view that as a call option on SoFi as an innovative company to know that I can make outsized bullish bets, something that might seem far-fetched in the moment, but I know that the company will innovate and introduce new offerings or new partnerships or new product lines to eventually get there. The MBA is just an example of that, but there's multiple examples of SoFi that does not just include them sandbagging a quarter than triple beating. It actually includes them, you know, releasing a new product line or a new partnership or a new Galileo API connection, whatever it may be. And they're eventually getting to those numbers. And so I know I, I can't stop talking about this MBA deal, but I truly think that it has the potential to be a really huge contributing factor to making SoFi a million a quarter. 
some people were saying this on the live games, you could see the, the SoFi sticker uh, because it's virtual signage. You know, when you clip some of the live games, you can see it. So in some of the clips, you can see it. But when I think it's the NBA official that's retweeting it or the team account that's retweeting it, uh, sometimes it doesn't appear. It appears live in the moment for the viewers watching the game. It also appears in some of the clips, depending on who's clipped it and how. But a lot of these official replays that people share on online don't include it, which is kind of a bummer. I agree. But I think still the overarching point is the NBA is something that we weren't predicting because it was an unknown factor back in December. And just the fact that this company can do that to now make sure that we can get closer to even those most bullish sentiments, what we thought was previously outrageous. I think that is a e-success trait of a company that consistently innovates. And by investing in that company, you are essentially placing a portion of your money on the call option on the future products that they're going to release. I've said this time and again about Tesla to say like, oh, well, I'm buying Tesla shares because it's like a call option on Elon's brain because, you know, they can release a robot and that robot can be bigger than the car sure. business or whatever it may be. Similar yeah. story with SoFi, right? All of the products that they have not released yet, that is alpha, you know, of you investing today versus tomorrow. It's all about that name recognition and trust. They're doing a phenomenal job on this where uh, Noto mentioned that when he first started, I think they, they ran some surveys and they take hundred people in the street and uh, ask them to name a financial institution and maybe 2% would say SoFi. Um, now, like if, if you bring up SoFi, like, oh yeah, I've, I've heard of that or that, that's a bank, right? And, you know, so it's, it's a lot of improvement we've seen in the member growth as well. And the think- NBA deal is not insignificant. I think he said uh, it's seven percent now, but it's uh, very fluctuating. They said they've seen it as high as eleven percent at one point, but extremely fluctuating. With this NBA deal, a large part of it, and the reason how they're going to try to get um, new customers is with this ten thousand dollar a week uh, bonus that they're giving away, which is not a lot of money for for uh, SoFi to do like at all. So don't worry about that in terms of customer acquisition costs. But Roy, I wanted to pitch this question. Do you think that this is kind of running into a little bit of a PayPal issue where they went after every and all customers um, with no real idea of if those customers were going to pay back that customer acquisition cost? Um, Like in a way where we're just getting people to sign up. They don't need to make any purchases, deposits, anything, just signups for the sake of members where potentially they might not even know what we offer or, or what we have in store? I don't see that at all. Um, PayPal had no concrete vision that actually unified them. They they, they did mergers and acquisition very poorly. Um, they were really actually concerned about the customer count, not uh, the actual numbers, uh, what the customers were doing. Um, that shifted, thankfully, under new management, um, and that's been a really good change. Uh, SoFi, while they certainly do pay attention, and they need to because they are mostly a bank on the customer counts, um, that's not what they seem to be most focused on. Uh, any interview that you see them talk about, they're not talking customer accounts most of the time. It's very rare. It's if there's a direct question on it. And so they need to cover it. They need to talk about it. It, it is a part of their thesis. But the other thing too is you can live without PayPal, just to be honest. You know, it's, it's a great business. Uh, they've done well historically. 25% of e-commerce worldwide runs through PayPal. So they're not dead. They're not gone. But if you're like, hey, I hate PayPal because of what they did to Canadian truckers, then you can get around without PayPal. SoFi, yes, you can get without uh, around without SoFi, but you need a bank. Like everybody needs a bank. You don't necessarily need a physical one. So if somebody is you know, signed up there and they, they have that on the side, they might not take it seriously, do direct deposit or anything. But uh, it's a whole lot easier to transfer assets and to get set up, change your direct deposit over once you sure. have that initial uh, agreement. So I don't think that this is in any way uh, the same thing. Plus, they have such a sweet a range, uh, mint and suite of products that maybe a person doesn't want to make SoFi their primary bank, but they, for some crazy reason, love the invest platform or really like the credit cards or, you know, they sign up. Relay wouldn't be too huge, but they're like, hey, let me get let me check out the, the home loan business with SoFi. Um, so that can lead to some good things. Ladies and gentlemen, that's been the SoFi Weekly. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. (laughs) Bye.